what is the economy? Because uh, I hear a lot of politic, uh, politicians that go and say, oh, the economy, we can't do this because of the economy. The economy is almost like a, a boogeyman in the closet. <laughs> and I wonder if you can just briefly describe what, what is this economy? Uh, so the economy, broadly speaking, is uh, all of us Canadians uh, trading goods and services back and forth for money. It's uh, people starting businesses, making a profit. It's people getting paid for doing work. Uh, another big part of the economy is the government, which collects taxes from taxpayers in Canada and uses that money to provide programs and provide supports for, uh, for Canadians. And so the economy, broadly speaking, is all those activities combined together. What fiat reformers tend to ignore when quoting history is that in ancient money created by law systems, the prices of critical commodities were also dictated by law. In fact, the value of money was defined by the ruler as so much of a certain commodity. Charge more or less for the designated commodities and it could be off with your head. Today, price controls like this could only be achieved in a self-isolated and totally bureaucratically controlled economy like Soviet communism. In a free market global economy, money created by law is bound by the same laws of supply and demand as any other single uniform commodity money. In other words, pure fiat money in a free market is an illusion. There's no such thing. Is it uh, suggesting a different kind of accounting system instead of uh, our uh, regular monetary economic system? Is there any uh, alternative to it? Well, often the kind of things that we do is we look at alternative policies that governments could implement. So the, the economy, quote unquote, does not usually restrict the governments as much as politicians would like to do the types of things that they want to do. And so oftentimes governments will say, you know, we don't have enough money to, uh, to implement uh, affordable childcare in Canada or something along those lines. Uh, but those are political decisions. They're not economic decisions. I mean, we could have affordable child care in Canada if we wanted to, but those decisions are, are not about the economy, they're actually about politics. And so a lot of these things often get mixed together to say that, uh, well, the economy won't allow us to do that. It's often saying, whatever my political stripe is won't allow me to do that. And that's a very different problem than saying, you know, we don't have money to do it. In most cases, we do have enough money to provide, uh, you know, well-funded programs for Canadians, good jobs for Canadians and so on. But we're making political choices about that, not economic choices alternative currencies, all of them based on some concept of money being created as self-issued credit. Many examples of such systems exist today all over the world. Some are very successful business-to-business -business barter networks in which businesses create product credit money to use among themselves, independent of banks and government, and usually interest-free. Such systems are tolerated, and in Switzerland, the existence of the Weir system is generally credited with stabilizing the banking system by expanding when the conventional system contracts and vice versa. But in the past, when they became too successful, alternative currencies were usually suppressed by the banking system or even outlawed by government. So, Active suppression is the most significant external problem. Mm. Now, these uh, political choices, are, are they're based on ideologies. Uh, so what are those main right. ideologies uh, about paying taxes? Well, I'm not sure that anyone is excited about paying taxes. I'm certainly not excited about paying taxes. Uh, but I think what, and, and if you ask someone, you know, do you want to pay no taxes? People say, yeah, absolutely, I want to pay no taxes. Of course, I want a tax cut, right? But that's not really the interesting question. The interesting question is, uh, are you willing to pay more taxes to get better services? And there, people are far more willing to pay more taxes. So if you were to say, you know, would you pay a bit more taxes to get better education, better health care? Would you provide, uh, you know, would you pay more taxes to get uh, uh, better child care? Uh, and once you start asking those types of questions, which are the real trade-offs that happen in government, what are you going to do with that tax money? not merely the tax money is being collected, you get very different answers than just asking people, you know, do you want a tax cut? People say, yeah, I want a tax cut. In the same way that if you said, you know, do you want this free car? People would say, yeah, I want the free car. Um, but that's not really an interesting question. 
And so I always find what's most interesting is when you say, when people say, well, I want a tax cut, you know, I pay too much in taxes. You say, okay, well, what, what do you want cut to pay for that tax cut? Do you want less health care? Do you want less education for your kids? What would you like cut to pay for that? And then it becomes a real trade off. And I think it leads to much more interesting thought um, rather than just saying, you know, it's, it's free money. Because it's not free money, it comes from someplace and it usually comes from cutting services. Mm -hmm. So I hear you saying that uh, if people understood what they're paying for, then uh, taxes don't become a burden, but rather a, a, a responsibility that we all have to contribute with. What is the CCPA uh, position on that idea that uh, a transaction tax, a universal transaction tax of uh, a 1% or even a fraction of a 1% would actually abolish all, all, all other taxes, including the personal income tax? Yeah, there's there's various incarnations of this scheme um, where uh, folks trading certain things pay some tax on it. In many cases, extremely small. I mean, one percent is actually quite large. When you think of like a foreign exchange tax, so when you convert one currency to another, you pay some extraordinarily small tax, like 0.1 percent. So if you and I were buying a hundred bucks to go to the U.S., uh, it wouldn't make any difference to us. We'd see some small tax, but it's not really worth anything. But the international traders that are transacting billions of dollars, well, now, now they see a, they pay a lot of tax on that, uh, and so you could have a, a, a tax on on foreign currency exchange. You could have a tax on financial transactions. So every time you buy a stock or sell a stock, and for most of us, even you know if that rate was quite small, 0.1 percent or something like that, we wouldn't see that in our day to day. But for the big folks that have huge portfolios, they would see that, and then they would uh, pay an amount on that. So there's various incarnations of this. Uh, tax, you know, put a very small tax on the transaction of certain uh, assets. So it's stocks or it's uh, financial securities or whatever. Uh, and uh, so this, this is an idea that, that certainly gained a lot of traction. You could definitely raise a lot of revenue. One of the big downsides of this approach is that it often requires international cooperation. So if only Canada implemented it, uh, then the folks that would otherwise invest in the Canadian stock market would move there their investments to the U.S. stock market, where such a which such a tax doesn't exist, and so what would be required is to say all of the big, uh, you know, the G8 or half the OECD would agree to some sort of tax of this kind, and then at that point uh, you could collect this money without fear the money would go someplace else because you've already covered all those markets. Yeah, tell me, uh, David, why do do we need uh, foreign investment in Canada? Well, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a funny issue. Today, we actually don't need foreign investment in Canada. Canadian corporations hold over $600 billion in cash on their balance sheets. And so it's a bit meaningless to say that we need more money from the outside to come and invest in Canada because we don't have enough. In fact, we have far too much. We don't even, you know, the Canadian uh, corporate world doesn't even know what to do with this money. So the money just continues to accumulate in their, in their bank accounts, in essence. Uh, and so... The idea that we need some extra money from outside is a bit ridiculous now that we've got $600 billion sitting in Canada in cash that could be used to invest in uh, whatever companies generally invest in, building a new factory, investing in workers, and so on. Um, and so at this point, that's a bit of a meaningless concept given what's happening in corporate Canada. Okay, so if that is the case, then uh, uh, transaction, transaction tax uh, that would discourage perhaps uh, foreign investors uh, wouldn't really affect us. So transaction tax, as you say, with a, the, the fraction of 1%, would still be better off than uh, uh, what, what we have r right now. Um, yeah, and it's actually something that we've advocated for in our alternative federal budget, and we do it every year. We advocate for a financial transactions tax, quite a small one that would on the one side reduce volatility in the stock market so you don't see the big ups and downs, um, but as well provides revenue to, uh, to the federal government uh, that they could use to fund programs. Uh, and so this is definitely something we've been for in the past and uh, you know we've done some estimates as to how much money it would raise, so it's certainly something that we're in favor of. If you put a, a general transaction tax of say 0.5% in general for all transaction taxes, would that make up for all other taxes? No. Um, I mean, a financial transactions tax in Canada would raise in the neighborhood of $4 billion a year. And so that's, you know, that's a fair amount of money. There's, there's no doubt about it. But that certainly wouldn't replace all of the taxes in Canada. Uh, you know, the vast majority of taxes collected are collected through the personal income tax system and GST and to a smaller extent, the corporate income tax uh, mm -hmm. 
corporate income taxes outside of a financial transaction tax. Um, but it, it, I mean, it does have a, a role. We've argued in the past uh, in terms of reducing volatility in, in capital markets, reducing volatility in stock markets, as well as raising revenue. This is all about numbers, right? This is regulating how much is that transaction tax, because you're saying uh, it would collect only four billion dollars, which is not enough. But that is based on certain amount of transaction tax. I don't know. You said point zero one percent or something yep. like that. Yep. Uh, if if you were to raise to point five or point six percent, wouldn't or to whatever it's necessary to replace other taxes. So. Why is the CCPA not advocating a higher transaction tax? I mean, it could be it could be somewhat higher. Uh, you know, we've got a variety of different types of taxes in the alternative budget that uh, we advocate for every year. One of which is just a straight corporate income tax rate on on profits made, and so that's a bit more of a straightforward tax. It has some history. Uh, certainly, you could raise the value of the financial transactions tax. Uh, I don't so think you ever so, get. So why don't, don't you? Why, why, why don't you do that? Well, so why is the C CPA not doing it? You say we could raise the transaction tax. But so my question is, why don't you do it? Well, we could never raise it, I don't think, to the level that it would replace other types of major taxation, like corporate income tax rate, because this isn't that kind of volume in Canada. Like you'd end up with a 50% transaction tax, which would be totally ridiculous, right? Um, and, you, and you still probably wouldn't replace the value of the corporate income tax rate or the personal income taxes. Uh, and so, I, and so, I mean, there is a trade-off here. Obviously, like there's a reduction in volume as you increase the tax rate, but as the tax rate gets to be 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, well, you would there would be no there would be no stock market anymore in Toronto. And so, there is a trade-off there. Don't get me wrong. I think that 0.1 percent is a fairly small amount. Yeah. Once we got to 50 percent, I think there'd be a problem. Yeah, yeah, you could raise from from 0.1 to maybe 0.5 or something like that, and it could be a lot better. Uh, anyway. That is the transaction tax. Uh, what are the main ideologies of uh, distributing uh, social services and, and so, uh, services and, and goods and services to the population? Um, I've heard this uh, the Marxist ideology of to each according to his need, and obviously in our society we have to to each according to the ability to pay. So. Uh, to, to what degree is the CCPA advocating this uh, Marxist ideology of to each according to his need? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that the CCPA has a has a defined ideology that we've uh, that we have in some sort of uh, document that we provide. I mean, one of the things that, that's quite important to us is to take a look at the progressivity of changes in the tax transfer system. That is to say, are we implementing programs that? provide tax benefits to wealthy Canadians or are we implementing programs that provide tax benefits to poorer Canadians? And what are the impacts on income inequality? What are the impacts on the poverty rates in Canada? Ideally, the types of things that we're implementing in terms of changes in taxes or changes in transfers would reduce poverty, would reduce income inequality, uh, would flow to the middle class and the, low, the lower income brackets in Canada and not to the upper income brackets, like something like income splitting, which does skew heavily to the high end. Uh, and so looking at uh, the way that government transfers work through the lens of income inequality, I think, is one of the ways that we uh, try to make sure that the distribution is, is fair, broadly speaking, uh, and in fact benefits those that have the least. Uh, another uh, term that people, uh, most people perhaps don't quite understand is the GDP, uh, the gross uh, domestic product. And uh, what, what does it do? And, uh, and why do we need it? Well, simply put, it's the, it's the measure of all of the money that we've spent over the course of a year. So if, you know, if my salary goes up $100, GDP goes up $100. Uh, if uh, you, know, you sell uh, a chair uh, for $50 and your profit's $20 on that, GDP goes up by $20, the profit margin. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a counter that just counts all year and makes track keeps track of all those transactions at the end of the year what you get is GDP uh, I mean or it can be broken down a different you could have it at the end of a quarter or a month or whatever but that's the basic idea is that you're just adding up all the transactions that happen over the course of a given period a month a quarter a year whatever um, and so it's an important measure and then it tells us uh, in that it, it's one way to tell us how the economy is doing and how Canadians are doing uh, are they faring well uh, is the economy strong compared to the last quarter, the last year, 
Uh, and frankly, uh, we'd be blind without a measure like that. Uh, but it's not the be all and end all. I mean, it's not the only answer when you say, how are Canadians doing? You can't just pop up a GDP figure and say, there we go, we've defined it. I mean, there are other important features as well. Yeah, I, I noticed that some countries, the uh, GDP grows uh, exponentially. Uh, the, the, their GDP is wonderful, yet uh, the poverty is high too. And uh, there are a lot of people that are making a huge amount of money and a lot of people that are not making at all. So GDP does not necessarily measure the well-being of a nation. It certainly does not measure the well-being of a, of, a, of a nation. And so you could have, you could imagine a country where one person made all of the income and so the GDP goes up, they make 5% more, but is that country better off? No, we wouldn't say that country's better off at all. And so GDP does not measure distribution. It does not measure who's getting all that money, who's making that, you know, who's making the salary increases, who's benefiting from profits. Uh, and so you need other measures for that. You need to look at measures of income inequality, like the Gini measure or breaking it down uh, through deciles or something like that. The other thing it doesn't measure is that, uh, is that economic production isn't necessarily a positive good. So if we went to war, we'd have a lot of economic production. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone was coming over bombing Vancouver, right. uh, I'd take a lot of economic work to put Vancouver back together. So is that good for Canadians? I mean, it's good for the it's good for the GDP growth, but it's not good for Canadians. So uh, and so it's yeah. it's a measure. It's an important measure. But why but is it important, David? You you're you're just saying you're just telling me that it does not measure income inequality which is uh, the best basic measurement for uh, society well-being. So if, if it's not important for the well-being of society, why is the GDP important to the average well, person? If, if you're only looking at GDP, that's probably a mistake. If you're only looking at income inequality, that's probably also a mistake. Uh, and so if you're, or if you're only looking at uh, uh, whether we're, you know, whether we're going to war or not going to war, that's also maybe a mistake. I think what we need to do is have a broader picture of economic well-being that isn't exclusively whether GDP is up 2% this year or down 2%. Uh, we should also be asking who got that GDP, who benefited from that? Are there more jobs that were created because of that GDP growth? Those are all additional questions that gives us more insight into what's going on in the economy. But addition, without any of those measures, too, we'd be quite blind. If we didn't know what the unemployment rate was, if we didn't know what GDP was, uh, we wouldn't be better off because of that. Yeah. The other term that gets linked with GDP is economic growth. And here in, in British Columbia, we have a premier that mentioned many times in her speeches economic growth. We have to grow the economy. We need to grow the economy is a mantra, you know. And I, I wonder what is this? Why, why is it necessary for the economy to grow, which goes back to the GDP? As we were saying, it's not how big the pie is, but how are we uh, cutting it? How are yeah. we sharing it? So the same thing is with economic growth. Why is the, the economy have to grow? Well, I mean, I guess the, broadly speaking, the idea is that when the economy is growing, uh, there's more money to go around to create new jobs, more money to go around to increase incomes, potentially there's more money to go around to pay for increases in taxes, to pay for new programs. Um, but I think if, if, the, if your sole focus is on economic growth, you're missing a whole bunch of the picture about what the well-being of Canadians are. And the number one technical obstacle to doing anything serious about it is the current growth-addicted money system, which is itself unsustainable. The crisis is upon us. Uh, e even if the economy didn't grow, and, and whatever we have, we were sharing properly, does it really matter that it grows or not grows? Well, I mean, you know, economic growth over time is, is, is not unimportant in terms of our ability to keep up with population growth, for instance. So the Canadian population is growing. Uh, if we don't have a growing economy, we're not producing more money over time to help increase wages over the long term for a growing Canadian population. Uh, and so I'm not sure that we should focus exclusively on economic growth. But look, if we saw a couple of years of zero economic growth or, you know, 10 percent lower economic growth year over year, that would be a very serious problem. Because? Uh, well, because it's going to filter down to the income level. So it's going to filter down to wages. It's going to filter down to, to employment or unemployment. Uh, and, and it's going to filter down to the, the types of jobs that Canadians have part-time or full-time. So these, these measures are connected, right? Un unemployment, uh, wage type, wage growth, these are connected to GDP. Um, they're not independent. That being said, 
it's important to look at all of them, not just one of them. Mm -hmm. Because I can see some natural growth, like you were saying, population. If uh, immigration is allowing thousands of people coming to Canada and we're growing and population, obviously uh, more people are going to be working and the, the economy is going to be growing naturally. I mean, there's a natural growth, but why does it have to be more than other nations? In terms of, you know, if you're comparing Canada to the U.S. to Sweden, there's often not a huge difference in growth rates between developed countries mm -hmm. in the long term. I mean, in the short term, there certainly can be, but in the long term, you don't see those kinds of huge differences. Yeah. And the economic growth of Canada could be linked with uh, selling more oil or selling more trees. Mm -hmm. And does it really, how does it affect to the local economy? Are we having more employment because of that? Or, you know, so economic growth is not necessarily a, a, a sign of uh, well-being in a country. Well, I mean, it, it, you know, again, it, it cuts different ways, right? Economic growth has certainly been driven in Canada recently by raw resource extraction and export. And so for folks in northern Alberta, it's been a real boom for them, right? The incomes have gone up. The unemployment's very low. Uh, the downside of that is when oil prices go down, the opposite happens. Um, and so for Canada, the employment boom in Alberta has been important for GDP growth. But again, as you say, if you're only focused on GDP growth, you miss the fact that there are substantial amounts of new CO2 that are being put into the atmosphere to extract this very difficult to extract form of oil. Uh, and there are substantial long-term downsides to that. And so if you're only focused on GDP, you miss this environmental impact, despite the fact that there was job growth and uh, you know, income growth as well. Um, that, that GDP alone is not a sufficient measure to say whether the well-being of Canadians is increasing. And the other measure is distribution, egalitarian well, distribution. There's a variety, right? Distribution is important. Uh, the the nature of the job market is important. The environmental impact, as you were mentioning earlier, is important. These are all measures that we should be incorporating into our idea of what uh, of whether Canadians are better off or worse off than last year. Mm -hmm. Another term linked with uh, growth is inflation. Where does inflation come from, and why why do we have inflation, and does it matter for the average person that there is inflation? Well, inflation is a relatively new phenomenon, actually. It started in the, the uh, early 1900s. Yeah, so inflation is just the idea that the, the cost of goods goes up every year. So the cost of a coffee at Tim Hortons is 2% more expensive this year than last year, 4% two years ago, and so on. And so for most Canadians, hopefully if wages are also increasing at 2% a year, um, it's sort of neither here nor there. But it does become important when you're comparing um, wages or, or cost of goods over longer periods of time. Um, although it's, it's actually a relatively recent phenomenon starting in the, the early 1900s. Prior to that, there really wasn't inflation like there is today. Mm. But where, why is there inflation? Like, why, where does it come from? Well, I guess in part it's because we're all used to seeing prices go up 2% and that's okay. Yeah, but so, why do the prices go up? Well, because I guess we'd all have to agree to not increase our wages ever again, uh, and therefore, and then all the businesses would have to agree to never increase their prices again. And at this point, that's pretty unlikely. So, what's a more likely scenario is that uh, we continue to ask for an increase of one or two percent every year, and the cost of those goods that the that the you know the business owner provides goes up one or two a year as well. This ever-growing national debt expands the money supply when new money is created by the central bank to buy more government debt. And the interest burden, passed on through taxes, adds to the cost of almost everything we buy, one way or another. In contrast to money being created as national debt, fiat money simply spent into existence would save the taxpayers immense sums of interest. It would free future generations from impossible debt. And it would forestall the tendency to inflation because the money supply would not grow forever with the national debt as there would be no national debt. Do you think there is some truth into it? Uh, there may be. I mean, I'm not an expert in monetary okay. policy. Um, okay. But the, the, idea, the idea that an expanding monetary base can drive inflation, I think, is, is not terrifically controversial as the, mm. banks provide, as the banks create money when they provide loans for mortgages or whatnot. Yeah. Um, that's one of the ways that we can drive inflation. Mm -hmm. The problem these fiat money reformers have with the current system is that government has given away this power to private bankers and is now borrowing at interest money it could create itself 
with a few keystrokes just like the banks do. This results in a massive unpayable national debt on which interest will forever be paid. The Bank of Canada should uh, lend all the money to the provinces and the municipalities at 0% interest. Um, do you think that is possible or do you uh, have an opinion on that? Well, it will in fact about 15% of all federal debt is held by the Bank of Canada effectively at 0% interest in the sense that the Bank of Canada is owned by the federal government and so any interest they pay just goes right back to the, the federal government. Yeah. Uh, and so the arrangement as it stands today, if the Bank of Canada were to provide loans to the municipalities or provinces, um, any uh, any amount or buy those bonds rather, that would be the way to do it, is, it, is, the, is the, if the Bank of Canada bought the bonds specifically or all of the bonds of the provinces, um, then they could effectively set it up such that it was zero interest. There's nothing inherently uh, difficult about it. Nearly stopping us from doing that. Yeah. Mm. Mm. But you you haven't uh, uh, in the budget and the alternative budget a recommendation for uh, the Bank of Canada to increase that 15 percent that you mentioned uh, of uh, loans to the provinces and other levels of government. No, we haven't. Um, I mean, interest rates for the federal government are quite. I mean, they're not zero, but they're very low right now. Very low, mm -hmm. and so. Um, that isn't it's an issue, not yeah. the impediment for the for the federal mm -hmm. government to invest in infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's not something we've included explicitly. But it's but you know the Bank of Canada routinely buys Government of Canada bonds, uh, mm -hmm. and so there's nothing inherently unusual about that. Well, is it about thirty billion dollars that the uh, Government of Canada pays on interest to the private lenders for the deficit that we have over? Five hundred million dollars, something, and if we could save that thirty billion dollars, imagine the amount of uh, social services we could do with it. But I mean, it's kind of neither here nor there in the sense that, that the interest rates are already very low, uh, and it's not the impediment to spending on infrastructure. Yeah. But the, the the fact that the whole number, even if they're very low, the total number is over thirty billion dollars mm -hmm. that we pay in interest. That's yeah. just the federal government. If you include the provincial and the municipals, it doubles. It's more than $60 billion. Uh, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives doesn't have a policy on it or recommendation to, to, to stop that $60 billion of giving away to the banks? Yeah, I mean, we, we haven't written a paper on the, on the issue specifically, although, I mean, I'm in favour of the federal government actually guaranteeing the loans from the provincial and municipal governments mm. uh, as a way of dramatically reducing their interest rates, particularly at the municipal level, um, where interest rates tend to be higher. I think that's one way that the government at relatively, I mean, essentially cost-free um, could uh, reduce the interest rates for the provinces. Would you like to ask your candidate to Member of Parliament for a referendum on banking and monetary reform? You can explore this issue by going to nowpolling.ca and clicking on Canada. From there you have a list of topics and one of them is Money and the Bank of Canada. Money and the Bank of Canada, you have two polls, Debt Increased Costs and Bank of Canada Directors. You can start at either one and there is your poll. Remember that your participation is the essence of direct democracy.